this leads to the next discussion because in 2017, we've seen something that we haven't seen since 2000. 2000 is when gemtuzumab was given accelerated approval. That was the last time a drug was approved on, on by the FDA for AML until this year. And now we have four drug approvals. And let's talk about those because I want to spend the next section talking about drugs that are now commercially available for our patient with acute myeloid leukemia and how we're going to fit them in. So we need to discuss the data and then discuss how we are utilizing these drugs. And, I, and I'd like to think about these four drugs in the following way. They're all targeted, but they're targeted in a different way. So uh, CPX351, as the investigators called it, is the liposomal donorubicin cytarabine uh, formulation. That's targeted to a clinically defined group of patients, those with treatment-related AML and AML with myelodysplasia-related changes. And then there are two drugs that are targeted to mutations, and that's uh, mitostorin for patients with uh, previously untreated AML with FLT3 ITD or TKD mutations, and acitinib, which is the oral IDH2 inhibitor approved for IDH2 mutated AML in relapse or refractory, so not upfront. And then finally, a different kind of targeted therapy, an antibody drug conjugate against CD33, gemtuzumab, azogamycin. Oh my God, it is back. Okay. And, and now, it's not for everybody. What? It's for everybody. And it's for yeah. everyone. Yeah. It's for, I mean, pediatrics, adults, up front, with chemo, relapse, refractory, uh, the unfit. Okay. So now we have to set this in, in, into perspective. So a quick update about CPX351. Um, this is the liposomal formulation. I don't believe it's just a fancier and more expensive way of giving those two drugs. There's something about the biology of giving donorubicin cytarabine in a fixed one to five molar ratio that actually may make this combination synergistic and the liposomal formulation allows you to deliver that. And it appears deliver it a little bit more selectively to the marrow and to the leukemic cell if you believe the preclinical models that have been generated. So it's based on preclinical development. And there was a randomized phase two study in older patients with AML that um, compared CPX351 to seven and three and, and saw a benefit only in the subset of patients with secondary AML. And that is what was the genesis and of the large And how did they define secondary AML? Clinically, and you're, you're exactly right. right. We're gonna discuss that very point um, as okay. we go along. So it was defined clinically. And so the phase three study was for patients between 60 and 75 who had AML that was previously untreated, and it was treatment-related AML. It was AML with, um, with a anesthesia hematologic disorder, whether they received uh, a hypomethylating agent or not. It was for patients with CMML, um, not just MDS, but CMML. Um, and it was for patients with apparently de novo AML with cytogenetically defined myelodysplasia-related changes. So to your point, Eunice, no, it was not a molecular panel. And I agree with you, we don't have that molecular data yet. And we also don't have a, de a definition that comes from morphology. So you'll get a path report that says this is AML with myelodysplasia related changes based on the way it looks under the microscope. Those were not the inclusion criteria for the study. That's so right. we don't know if it benefits those patients. And, I'm and not that saying could be subjective, right? I mean, I, subjective I think that our pathologists might all differ. Not, yeah. not only subjective, that subset, that third subset of myelodysplasia related changes, but now the WHO, uh, the uh, uh, criteria of 2016, have added a nuance, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. It's my, if they have 50% more dysplasia, more than two lineages, but no nucleophosphine, no biallelic CBP alpha mutation. So what do you do if you actually give CPX351 based on the label and then find out from your next gen panel that they have favorable, that they have favorable risk? I don't think you've done them a disservice, but it's not really in the label anymore. And, and there were patients on the study that had nucleophosphate mutations. Yes. So it's not to say right. that those patients were excluded. It's That's just right. we don't know there's a proven benefit. Right. Did you want to say something? Well, I, I was going to say, I was going to emphasize what, what Harry mentioned. I, I, I think that um, you're not going to do a disservice to these patients. The, the randomized phase two studies, both on frontline on, on front and in salvage, show that um, the, the survival was, there was a trend for survival for the overall population and it was significant for these secondary. So you can say that at the very least it's equivalent to three plus they seven. They don't do worse. No. Exactly, no. so no. they don't do worse. So, I mean, you may decide to change because of cost or other considerations or whatever, but it's not, a, it's not a necessarily it's an adverse yeah. thing. Yeah. Right. Now, I do have a question about that is, 
because we consider these for secondary AML, um, but one group that was not included is secondary for myeloproliferative neoplasm. Absolutely. Right. So should we use it or not in that subset? Well, not based on the label, but based on... I, I would say, first of all, I, I think that's a great clinical trial to do. Those patients have a horrible outcome, right, uh, who progressed from myelofibrosis right. and ET or polycythemia vera. But you have to be careful because if you truly, it, that would be an off-label use because the myelodysplasia-related changes, MDS or an overlap of MDS and MPN like CMML or a typical CML, but it did not include those patients. So it would be an off-label use. I don't think we know enough to say, yes, we should be using that drug. Yes, we need something better than seven and three, um, and we should do the clinical trial to evaluate that. 